नमस्ते तप्त कंचन गौरांगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी वृषभानु सुते देवी प्राणमामी नमोस्तुते so the ultimate perfection or full enlightenment is experienced by the devotee as mahabhava now what is this mahabhava bhava means ecstatic symptoms devotional love and mahabhava is when several of these ecstatic conditions converge and lead to a state which is beyond everything even consciousness this is samadhi so the same result is attained ah uh, by bhakti as in meditation so now let's analyze <laughs> well there are two different kinds of analysis one is ordinary analysis which accepts the context and the uh, meanings directly given and then there is a meta analysis which puts the uh, thing being analyzed in a greater context and then uh, reflecting the meaning to give a broader significance so in these spiritual matters the context in today's society has been lost unfortunately uh india has been conquered culturally by the west so everywhere you go people wearing western clothes uh, uh pursuing material gain instead of spiritual realization and so on so they have no context they have no background and in many cases the religion has become commercialized uh media has distorted everything and led to a, a situation where the least qualified people are becoming the most popular religious leaders and so on like that so the ability to analyze has been lost and all kinds of wrong conclusions and false knowledge are becoming the standard in society the western cultural values imposed by colonials have become entrenched even in the legal system in india so in that situation nobody can understand the actual import of the scriptures uh, this is a very dangerous situation uh, so we want to point out uh, the actual context for these uh, spiritual terms and discuss uh, the actual meaning in terms of practical sadhana so bhav means that the love of the god the ishta devata or the uh, principal object of devotion becomes extremely condensed huh like condensed milk if you take milk and you boil it 
Now, most people don't know because they don't, they don't have any more the knowledge of cooking with milk. But when you have cows, like we do here, uh, you, in the village, there's one big pot, and everybody puts the milk every morning and evening, and then it's boiled. And it boils down and boils down, and it goes through several stages. At first, it tends to foam up. Huh? And this is like in the beginning of spiritual life, when love of God is first experienced, then one tends toward external expression huh? and uh, different forms of prayers and dancing and singing and uh, so many outward expressions, performance of puja and so on. Uh, but then when the love becomes further condensed, like condensed milk, it, it settles down to a steady boil. This means that that love is always there, even under the surface, even during ordinary affairs, even uh, in uh, difficult conditions of life. It's always there and supports the d life of devotion. And then when the milk becomes further condensed, it's called kheer. And um, this is like uh, what we know in the West as condensed milk. It's not actually condensed, it's boiled down. Huh? So uh, what happens is in the devotee, the love of God reaches such uh, intensity that it is expressed in various symptoms like tears, um, goosebumps, pulakar, or uh, sighing, or loud laughter, huh? And these things look to the external world like uh, uh, sickness or craziness. Huh? But actually they are due to excessive joy, due to love of God. So when these things happen, um, these are called bhava. Bhava in devotional terminology means ecstatic symptoms. So when bhava happens, then uh, the love becomes extremely strong. And when several of these symptoms combine together at the same time, this is called Mahabhav. So, the Mahabhav is due to uh, excessive love, uh, just over the top, you know. And uh, this is the perfection of bhakti. My Adi Guru Srila Prabhupada called it the supreme perfection in his book, uh, Teachings of Lord Chaitanya. So this Mahabhava, in its natural context of bhakti, then is the perfection. So that's the analysis. Now let's take the meta-analysis ontological meta-analysis. In other words, we're going to analyze the analysis <laughs> using ontology. Ontology is a very powerful tool. Uh, it was first developed by, well, actually by the Vedic sages, but, and then it was very much amplified by the Greeks. The Greeks had a very powerful system of of philosophy, <clears throat> and when <laughs> when the Christians first started preaching in Greece, the Roman Catholics, you know, uh, they went to Greece, and of course, immediately the Greeks wanted to debate, 
and the Christians were crushed. They just, they couldn't even answer the questions of the Greeks. What is your epistemology? What is your ontology? What is your theory of knowledge? <laughs> they couldn't even answer. They couldn't even understand the question. So, uh, this ontology is very powerful. Ontology is called the science of sciences because it is the tool used to develop sciences. Science, as we know it today, is a direct result of the process of ontology, ontological analysis. And what is that? When we encounter something unknown, it could be an unknown physical phenomenon, uh, like uh, quantum mechanics, it could be uh, unknown mental phenomenon, such as this transcendental love of Godhead, bhakti. Uh, it could be a spiritual phenomenon. Uh, it could be any number of things that, it, the, the point is we don't know what it is. So we begin to investigate, and the first thing we do after observing is naming. We see a phenomenon, an unknown phenomenon, and we know we don't understand, so we simply give it a name. And then we find another phenomenon related to it, and we give that a name, and then we specify the relationship between those two, and we go on building what's called a terministic screen. Okay, so this gives us a vocabulary to describe what we have observed. And this alone can lead to dramatic insights into the nature of the phenomenon. So, in this case, Mahabhava, we don't know, or at least in Western culture, we don't know this kind of love uh, because we don't admit that there can be love between man and God. But in Eastern spiritual life, God is a tangible reality. And <clears throat> there is a very elaborate terministic screen of the terminology describing different kinds of divine love. So this is all described in my Adi Guru's books, and I was very fortunate to be one of the editors of his Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, the Antya Leela especially. Antya Leela describes in great detail this phenomenon of Mahabhava. But what happens when we step back and we put the whole thing in a larger context? We see that the whole uh, point or the whole thrust of Vedic spirituality is to remove one's attention from the pale, fragile, unsatisfactory, temporary things of the material world and to focus our attention on the, the beauty, the eternality, and the ecstasy of the spiritual world. Huh? Sat Chit Ananda. First of all, Sat, we become aware of the eternal existence. Then Chit, we uh, come to see that everything is consciousness, and of course this brings ananda, or bliss. So this bliss has many flavors and many gradations and so on like that. And uh, this is the uh, science, actually. Ontology builds sciences. So if we analyze this terminology of bhakti, according to ontology. 
uh, we can construct a, a very beautiful structure that shows the different levels of consciousness and devotion and how they relate to the individual. And the bottom line is that as we approach the supreme perfection, Mahabhava, we experience all the symptoms of advanced meditation. And anyone can experience these things by cultivation of bhakti. Beginning with karma yoga, and when karma yoga is complete, going, going into pure devotion with no material activities, no fruitive activities, all uh, aimed at spiritual realization, the whole life dedicated to attaining moksha. Uh, and then our spiritual life is complete. Aung. Tatsa. <laughs> Aung Shakti Aung.